All right, well, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Wyan. I am a healthcare senior manager here at Myers and Stauffer. Uh, we are a national accounting and compliance firm supporting government sponsored healthcare programs. And I am joined by my colleague, Bobby Courtney, who's a principal here at Myers and Stauffer. And he will be leading the discussion portion of today's session. This meeting is conducted for and on behalf of the Oregon Department of Consumer and Business Services. Information collected and recorded at this meeting is potentially subject to disclosure under a public records request. We are recording these sessions to ensure that we capture the feedback correctly. If you wish to speak and are uncomfortable with having a specific comment recorded, please let us know and we will temporarily stop the recording. We are here today on behalf of the Oregon Prescription Drug Affordability Board to solicit constituent feedback related to the use of upper payment limits or UPLs to improve drug affordability and to gather any recommendations you have on improving drug affordability for Oregonians. Um, also joining us today uh, from the PDAB board, we have Shelley Bailey, who is our board chair, um, and Ralph Magrish, who is the executive director and I am not sure if uh, Jane Horvath is on this uh, meeting, but um, Jane Horvath of Horvath Health Policy uh, is also supporting the board with their work. So before we begin today's session, I'd first like to thank everyone for attending. Um, we know that your time is incredibly valuable and we appreciate your willingness to share your perspectives on this important topic. So in order to level set on today's topic, we do have a brief series of prepared slides that we're going to review before we get into our discussion. Um, and this should take about 15 minutes and we ask that you hold any questions or comments until we've completed that presentation. And then once we've completed the slide deck, we have a series of questions that are designed to solicit your input and generate dialogue among the group. Um, during that time, we're not able to answer specific uh, questions related to methodology or affordability evaluations. However, we do have a mechanism that we will provide for you to submit those directly to the PDEP for consideration. And when we do get to that point in the session, uh, we would ask that you introduce yourselves uh, and speak clearly so we can accurately capture your feedback in our notes. Uh, and we also ask that you mute yourself, please, when you're not speaking. Uh, Zoom does have a raise your hand function, uh, and we would ask that everyone please use that in order to be recognized to speak, and that will make sure that we don't miss anyone uh, who wants the opportunity to make a comment. And then finally, we do recognize this is a very complex topic and one that will likely generate considerable feedback amongst the stakeholders. Uh, and as such, we are hosting a second meeting to continue our discussion and to allow everyone an opportunity to share their perspectives. So with that said, we will jump into the presentation. So the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, which we refer to as the PDAB or the board, uh, was established within the Department of Consumer and Business Services and is committed to protecting residents of Oregon, state and local governments, commercial and employer health plans, healthcare providers, pharmacies licensed in Oregon, and other constituent groups within the health system from the high cost of prescription drugs. The board was established by the legislature under Senate Bill 844 in 2021 and later codified into Oregon Revised Statute Section 646A.693. And again, our goal with these sessions is to get your perspectives on the use of upper payment limits to improve drug affordability, and also to gather any recommendations you have on improving drug affordability for Oregonians. Uh, and these sessions will inform the board's work uh, on developing a plan for establishing UPLs as required under Senate Bill 192. Through the authority that's granted by the Oregon legislature, the board is tasked with establishing a subset of drugs to review for affordability challenges within healthcare systems or with high out-of-pocket costs for patients in Oregon. Um, and the Oregon PDEB continues to refine its work, so I would encourage you to visit their website for updates to their meeting schedule and activities. Um, their next meeting is scheduled for July 24th, and information on this, the meeting schedules and activities can be found at the website that's given there on the uh, 
on the slide. So for purposes of providing some additional concept, context, um, there are other states that have established PDABs with three, Colorado, Minnesota, and Washington having full authority to establish um, UPLs. Uh, Vermont has most recently enacted legislation um, which tasked the Green Mountain Care Board with preparing a preliminary plan to develop and implement a program to regulate prescription drug costs um, with the uh, with the report to the legislature being due on January 15th of 2025, the report of the plan. Colorado is furthest along in the process and has initiated um, a rulemaking process to actually establish a UPL on Embril. Uh, their rulemaking hearings will take place in September, October, and December. Uh, and recently, they also deemed Cosentix and Stellara to be um, unaffordable. So in their 2022 report to the Oregon legislature, the board describes their concept for a UPL in Oregon. Uh, and specifically, it would establish a maximum amount that can be paid for a prescription drug. And it's similar to uh, a federal upper limit or a NADAC or a MAC price that's currently established and used on prescription drug reimbursement today. Um, but some of the basic concepts uh, described um, by the Oregon uh, report are an establishment of a maximum amount that can be paid for a prescription drug that is dispensed in Oregon, uh, leveraging an existing process of negotiating price concessions that already exist in the supply chain, uh, not intended to, to regulate how manufacturers list or set prices, uh, and it is intended to avoid impacting the best price in Medicaid. So this um, particular slide is adapted from work that was conducted by Jane Horvath from Horvath Health Policy. Um, in principle, UPLs should improve market function for prescription drugs um, that do have a UPL by achieving one or more of the listed outcomes, such as improved access and reduced costs within the system. And I know that everyone in attendance is probably pretty familiar with the complexities of the pharmaceutical supply chain. Um, but for purposes of level setting, because this, this particular presentation has been given to a number of different constituent groups, um, this slide is just intended to illustrate the process for retail and health system or physician administered drugs and their associated systems of payments, rebates, and product flow. Uh, in, in this diagram, we're describing a situation in which the UPL is implemented at the top of the supply chain flow. And for a little bit different way uh, of looking at this concept, this material, again, uh, adapted from work conducted by Jane Horvath uh, and offers a little different view of the concept um, that was presented on the prior slide. Uh, specifically, it's intended to illustrate the progression of the UPL through various parts of the pharmaceutical supply chain. And again, as noted, the UPL replaces the WAC, uh, the AWP, AAC, EAX, et cetera, uh, as the metric for financial transactions uh, within, uh, within the uh, supply chain or reimbursement chain. And so as we wrap up the presentation portion of uh, of this session, we wanted to talk a little bit about recent industry events that could serve as a guide for how a UPL might work in the marketplace, um, and most noticeably, a recent change to the federal Medicaid drug rebate program rules had an impact on the rebate rates uh, that would be paid by manufacturers, in some cases significantly, and in response, manufacturers for certain highly rebated drugs in the Medicaid space implemented reductions in WAC for these drugs. Um, and so this happened as a result of changes in Medicaid that would have reduced the cost of drugs below um, the cost paid uh, and required manufacturers to pay rebates that were higher than drug costs paid by Medicaid. And so we feel like this is important because it could serve as an analogy for how a UPL might similarly impact the supply chain. Uh, and we will come back to this concept in our discussion questions.
All right, so some of you participated in the survey that was provided in advance of these sessions, and we very much appreciate those responses. Um, we are going to explore some of those same sessions now uh, in this particular discussion, and so we appreciate your feedback and comments. And as a reminder, please remain on mute unless you're commenting. Uh, state your name and organization for us when making comments and use the raise hand function so that we can make sure we don't miss anyone who wishes to speak. And with that said, I will turn it over to Bobby Courtney to lead the uh, to lead the discussion. Great. Thank you, Linda. Um, just to reiterate uh, something Linda said, I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us today and really appreciate uh, you taking the time to provide us, uh, provide the board with uh, your feedback and insights. Um, just a couple quick things before I jump in. Um, wanted to uh, let folks know that while we are recording, uh, as Linda said, uh, for purposes of uh, taking, uh, taking, make sure we're capturing all of your feedback. Um, if there is a comment that you would like to make um, and you'd like to, us to turn the recording off, we're more than happy to do so. Uh, please just let us know uh, before, um, before you make your comment. Um, and also just to reiterate uh, something else Linda said, you know, these sessions are really designed as um, listening sessions. Uh, we're not, um, uh, we're not available to sort of respond to direct questions on behalf of the board. Uh, it's not our role here. We're um, uh, really here to solicit your input, uh, capture that, uh, and really compile it all and provide it to the board um, as they uh, work to meet their statutory obligations to provide a uh, report to the state legislature around a plan for uh, developing EPLs. So really looking to uh, glean as much insight and, and feedback as, as you all have uh, and can provide us. Um, we have a number of uh, questions that are, I'll say, are kind of grouped into general topic areas. So um, just to give you a little precursor of things to come, we're going to start by just discussing sort of the impact of affordability in general to really try and understand what it means to your specific constituencies. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the U uh, potential impact of a UPL, um, how you perceive uh, or may perceive that uh, um, um, playing out should a UPL be set on particular drugs. Um, talk a little bit about uh, UPL implementation, uh, how it might actually be implemented, not only um, really, I should say, across the supply chain, uh, get your thoughts on, on that. Um, talk about methodologies, uh, UPL methodologies a little bit and some considerations uh, that, that there are question, you know, ask about considerations you uh, might want the board to uh, make as they think about what a UPL, particularly UPL methodology might look like. Um, talk about the desired state of drug affordability. And then lastly, kind of wrap up by talking um, or asking about uh, specific recommendations you might have for the board, um, UPL related or not. Um, I think that the board is very interested in uh, hearing from uh, uh, these stakeholder groups um, about, uh, you know, other policies, strategies, approaches that um, you might suggest uh, they consider um, as they leverage, um, you know, their ability to uh, uh, work to uh, reduce the uh, uh, cost of drugs for, uh, or excuse me, improve affordability uh, of drugs uh, for uh, individuals. So with that, uh, we'll jump in. Um, something very simple, just sort of level setting a little bit. You know, um, I'm curious to hear, um, you know, from your perspective uh, and thinking about uh, drug costs today, what does affordability mean to your organization? Um, what do you think it means to the populations you support and or uh, patients you may interact with? Um, I know that being uh, primarily advocacy organizations, um, uh, you know, you, you're likely to have some uh, patient specific uh, concerns in mind. Uh, and so we'd love to hear that, um, you know, again, you know, what does affordability mean to your organization or, or the populations you interact with or serve? <clears throat> and feel free to uh, just jump right in. Uh, Linda suggested using the raise hand feature uh, just so we can make sure we're tracking everybody. Uh, Charlie, please. Hi, um, thanks for uh, holding these sessions and the opportunity to uh, engage. Uh, my name is Charlie Fisher. I'm the state director at Osperg. We're a statewide public interest organization. We represent thousands of Oregonians around the state. And um, we, for several years now, have been 
kind of collecting feedback and stories from our members and other Oregonians about the impact of high drug prices. Um, and so uh, just wanted to highlight a couple uh, briefly uh, examples that we've heard that really, I think, just highlight the fact that um, the cost of prescription drugs um, really have meaningful impact on people's lives. And uh, we're really excited that the ideally the um, PDAB will recommend a strong upper payment limit. Um, so first of all, uh, a member of ours uh, shared a story about um, taking Eloquis, uh, something that she needs um, for her health. And that last year, the cost of Eloquis went up uh, four times for her. So she was paying about $100 a month or $100 for a three-month supply. Uh, and then uh, in the next year, I had to start paying $400 uh, or more for a three-month supply. Another uh, person we talked to um, has ALS and um, it was having to pay uh, out of pocket for some of the, the drugs that, that he needed that cost thousands of dollars a month. Um, and then a third was a member of ours who ha has migraine medicine and just talked about how difficult that is to afford sometimes and the high expense of those drugs. So, you know, that this is a just a short uh, and non-comprehensive by any means uh, summary of, you know, some of the things we've heard from folks. But I think the, the through line is just that these drugs are incredibly challenging financially for a lot of people to afford. And, um, you know, the, the Oregonians need relief. So I'm excited to be here. And thanks for the opportunity to, to, to speak today. Thank you for that, uh, Charlie. I appreciate your feedback. Um, Lauren? Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for having uh, me. Actually, this is good afternoon. It's been a long day already, I guess. <laughs> um, first, I have a question and well, a question for you guys, a clarification, and then I would like to ask a question. So and, and respond to your question about affordability. So we do have education and advocacy for people with chronic disease, but we focus mainly on hepatitis C and lung cancer. Um, on your slide of the supply chain impacts, you had two different sort of ways that the UPL could go. At um, The first one that you showed, the UPL is implemented after the manufacturer price, but the co-pays for the patient are based off that price paid by the manufacturer. So there's a big difference between that and the next slide where the UPL is done after the, uh, or the patient pricing is done after that. So there's a big difference between those two slides, and I'm not sure which way you're going, but that would definitely sway the cost to patients, um, because if they're going off the price the manufacturer paid before the UPL was implemented, and you have a large copay, a 50% copay, it's going to be much different. Um, so just some clarification there, maybe, um, or maybe you don't know. I, I <laughs> um, But um, how does affordability impact the patients we serve? Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into cancer because cancer drugs are just special. Um, but in hepatitis C, you know, we Gilead came out with a very, very expensive drug. It's cure um, and, and worth every penny of it. But the problem with that expensive drug is that it, um, it, all the states put these draconian restrictions on the use of it. And they weren't medically necessary restrictions. They were just to control the price. And therefore, people are not getting treated. We only have 34% of our population cured, even though we have a cure. And it's been out for 10 years. And so the impact of a high-priced drug is that people don't have access. So for me, what's affordable is access. But on the other hand, I want to say that you can't get the generic drug for hepatitis C, which Gilead had to put out within two years of their of their cure coming out, they had to make a generic because they priced it so stupidly. And um, yet you can only get the generic if you pay cash or if you're in Medicaid. But if you are an individual and you have insurance, you have to pay for the brand name. You cannot go and get the drugs unless you pay cash and don't have insurance. That's the only way you get the generic unless you're, you're, PBM is, is giving you that. That's crazy. So that's a huge access issue that 
is resulting from an original high price of the drug. The drug is no longer high priced. Um, the drug is very affordable. It's cost effective. Now it's cost savings to the healthcare system. So there's no reason we wouldn't use it today, but I don't understand why the discrepancy there. And just to give you just a little bit of, you know, what happens when something comes in high priced, people are, people don't have access. And still to this day, doctors will not treat hepatitis C patients in rural Oregon because they don't think they can afford it. And that's not true. So um, just my experience. Thanks. Thanks for listening. And, and I would love a clarification on that supply chain. Do you want to, Linda, do you want to go back to those slides and, and, and sure. or describe those uh, again briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I appreciate that. We appreciate that feedback. It was intended, um, this was intended to show the UPL is kind of sitting right there um, in, in the, um, sort of in the top of the food chain, um, with the intent being that it, it flows all the way through the supply chain. If that's not clear, I, you know, I apologize for that, but it was, it was meant to, um, this is a little different than the one that follows simply because it was intended to be more of, um, an overall view of the supply chain and the complexity of the supply chain. Uh, whereas this one that follows is a little more of a linear diagram of, um, you know, of the cost billing and payment mechanism as opposed to all of the other assorted and very complex <laughs> uh, pieces and parts that happen um, not only in payment, but in distribution and, and rebates and billing and et cetera. So hopefully that helps uh, a little bit. Um, with understanding that they are not intended to be different, just a little bit different view. Okay, well then I would definitely move where that UPL is on that first slide because it, it definitely shows the patient paying the top price. Um, I would put the UPL above the manufacturer. Maybe you put your arrow up to the top there. <laughs> um, and, then, and then one final question I forgot to ask. Are there um, this... A policy is in effect for um, OEB and PEB, PEB, or however you do that uh, acronym for our state employees. Um, are any of those represented on this call today, or have they been interviewed? Are they part of these focus groups? Because they're really large constituencies that I would hope we were hearing from. Yes, we. So we've been conducting these focus groups now for I guess maybe a month now. Um, and there have been about six or eight different, I'd have to go back and kind of go through the, the list, but I think about eight different, six or eight different uh, kind of constituency groups. And then we have been uh, discussing uh, separately, um, uh, having some conversations with uh, PEB and OEB uh, as well, looking at some, some modeling as well. So, um, yes, yeah, so definitely uh, has been a consideration uh, in the discussion. And, and Lauren, I just want to clarify one, one, one point that you made and make sure I understand if we capture it correctly. Um, you had mentioned um, that, and, and I'm not sure if there was a specific, if it was the Gilead uh, drug you were referring to specifically, but you mentioned that um, individuals, presumably Oregonians, uh, can't get the generic unless they're cash pay or in Medicaid. Was that, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, right now, if you have uh, insurance, the the brand is the drug um, that they're putting out there. And if you go to purchase it and you want to pay cash, you can you can only get the generic if you pay cash and you do not have insurance. Otherwise, they will make you pay ten thousand dollars versus thirty six that thirty six hundred dollars for thirty days um, supply. And is that specific to? Um... Um, sort of commercial market. I'm just trying to understand, is that, is this like a formulary placement issue? Um, yeah, this is, for, this is, this is definitely PBM's formularies for sure. Okay. Yeah. Just want absolutely. to make sure that that's yeah. what you were yeah. driving and that we were yeah. capturing. Yeah. Place. Great. Thank you very much. Um, John, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, John Mullen and just for way of introduction on the board president, of the Oregon Coalition for Affordable Prescriptions, or OCAP. 
Uh, I just want to just acknowledge that uh, even though we're a group of advocates, our advocacy positions can be different on a number of things. Our approaches can be different. So I just want to state uh, a couple of things that uh, are important to OCAP. Uh, first of all, we're we're interested in industry transparency to understand how the dynamics uh, work all up and down the supply chain. Uh, I am not an expert in this area, and I admit to being mightily confused about all the ins and outs about how all of this works. Um, secondly, and really most importantly, we're interested in affordability, and we're concerned about uh, what uh, payers, uh, people who are purchasing drugs on behalf of patients, the affordability because it affects premiums uh, across the board. And we are concerned, of course, most importantly about what happens to consumers in this discussion. I would hasten to point out that um, we have no uh, position on individual drugs. We did support 192, and we're interested in a feasibility study about what UPLs would look like. We're interested in other issues that might lend itself to greater affordability. But we have no particular issue that we're trying to bring forward on behalf of an individual drug. So I think uh, we're, we're different along those lines uh, to other organizations that are here. But thank you for the opportunity to testify. And I just would acknowledge we're like two questions into uh, an hour and we're already halfway done. Uh, so I look forward to hearing from others. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, John. Uh, another John. John Bartholomew, would you like to go next? Yeah, hi, I'm John Bartholomew. I am um, government, government Affairs Director for AARP nationally. Um, I used to be um, the state advocacy person for the state office here in Oregon. I still live in Oregon. Uh, it's nice to see some of my friends, John Mullen and Charlie Fisher, who I, um, I agree with what they both said thus far um, on this call. Um, for AARP, so we have about 500,000 plus members in the state of Oregon alone, um, and uh, we hear from them very frequently about issues about drug affordability, concerns about not, not getting their medication because it's too expensive, you know, cutting their pills in half, just going without, having to make decisions between... Um, between buying their medication and their, uh, you know, paying for their heat bill, paying for food, et cetera. Um, and that's why we're involved in this. We're looking at it from the consumer perspective. And so when we're looking at what affordability means, one of the key aspects is looking at it um, fully, not just what they pay um, when they're paying a copay or a you know, uh, uh, cost sharing at the uh, at the pharmacy, um, that is important, as well as premiums. And what we want to make sure happens with the UPL in Oregon is that any cost savings that an insurer or a PBM uh, manages to get out of the upper payment limit, that they have to prove where that money um, goes back to the consumers, that they have to demonstrate to the PDAB, to the legislature, that they have reduced premiums or other cost sharing in the process. Because um, it's ultimately about the consumers being able to get the medications um, that they need to survive or live well. Um, and this actually should also end up benefiting the, uh, the manufacturers through um, better patient adherence to their medical medical. Uh, uh, you know, their plan, you know. So, um, you know, in the interest of time, um, I'll let somebody else go or move on to the next topic. Uh, but that's our priority is um, broadly consumer savings. Much appreciated um, for that, uh, that input. Before we move on to the next question, any other comments just on affordability in general? So I, what I'm curious to hear um, about uh, from your perspective and the, the, perspective, the, the perspectives that you may have heard from your uh, individual constituents, you know, we're, we're talking about UPLs, right? But there are a number of other, uh, you know, mechanisms that the board could consider uh, in order to address uh, affordability. Um, 
do you uh, have perspectives on what you think some of the most um, effective approaches might be to addressing this affordability issue more broadly? Go ahead, John. Yeah, we at AARP, we support a lot of different methodologies um, from at the federal level and at the state level. There is absolutely no one silver bullet to addressing this issue. Um, so we advocate at the state level for things such as importation of drugs from Canada. We advocate for um, greater use of bulk purchasing programs. We um, argue for state manufacturing of generic drugs as California is starting to do. And at the federal level, we are definitely advocating for um, patent reform, which is a, a major issue where you have the patent thickets that reduce competition, pay for delay deals, trying to really um, get those shut down so that there can be greater competition in the market. That's great. Thank you, John. Others have thoughts on um, uh, effective approaches to addressing affordability? John, go ahead. Yeah, a uh, couple of things that we think about. We haven't taken positions on these things, but um, uh, looking at the model at the federal level about what's happening with Medicare uh, negotiations and looking at the drugs there about whether we could do something similar in the state of Oregon. We also uh, think about international reference pricing, uh, noting that about between three and four times uh, uh, the cost uh, that we pay here uh, when we compare to the United Kingdom, uh, Japan, and some other places, uh, we're paying the highest prices in the world. So um, obviously something, at least from my perspective, something has to give. So uh, coming up with creative solutions, and as John Bartholomew mentioned, there's not one individual uh, thing that we can do that will take care of issues uh, such as as broad as affordability and affecting so many people. So we're open to some other discussions, but we are interested to see the UPL feasibility study go forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Charlie? Yeah, okay, I may, I'm not sure I completely understood the question, but I'm just gonna take a stab uh, based on what I've heard. Um, I mean, I think we at Osberg support, you know, all the things that, that John talked about at the federal level, the state level, as well as John, I guess both of the Johns. <laughs> um, we got a good, good cast of Johns here today. Um, but I mean, I think I would really say, I, you know, a lot of the things, especially at the federal level that, that John Bartholomew mentioned, uh, PAC, you know, various patent issues really are uh, leading to the, I think in our view, the primary problem, which is that just the, the prices set by manufacturers are too high. Um, and so I think that's why the upper payment limit is such, such an important policy because, you know, it, I mean, we've done transparency, um, we've done a lot of other things. Uh, we need to really go as far up the funnel as possible. And I think, and, and the, the, the prices that manufacturers set, which they can because they have, you know, monopoly pricing for the most part, uh, at least for the, you know, more expensive drugs uh, is really the the underlying issue that then cascades down into high out of pocket costs, high you know premiums, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I think you know we're really interested in having um, the upper payment limit be as strong and comprehensive as possible, um, because I think that's kind of you know the the policy we haven't quite done yet in, in Oregon that we've learned uh, is really needed for consumers. Great. Thank you, John. Tiffany. Hi there. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for everybody also on the call sharing your perspectives. It's um, extremely valuable and insightful. My name is Tiffany Westridge Robertson. I am the CEO, original founder of AI Arthritis, which is short for International Foundation Autoimmune Autoinflammatory Arthritis. I'm also a patient and I am on biologics. I've been on them um, for the duration of my disease journey. And we are a unique organization in that all of our leaders, all of our staff that are patient, that are public facing are actually patients. So I come wearing many hats here. And um, I just want to say, 
um, kind of a different perspective or a different spin. Some of this is based on experience with some of the other PDABs. But I think when we're thinking about affordability and the UPL and other things that we can look at, we have to start with the basics. We heard some of the some of the quotes earlier about um, situations where we can't afford our drugs. In my case, the manufacturer assistance program makes my drug zero, but I'm on many medications for my um, for my disease and my out-of-pocket costs are about $25 a piece, but times 10, that can add up, right? Um, but I think that identifying what is truly affordable and unaffordable to patients like myself that have these chronic illnesses, what actually makes us do the budgeting of the groceries, it's usually, it's definitely not my biologic, not my most expensive drug, which by looking at a whack would look like it was. That's my least affordable. I mean, my my least one that I have to worry about. I think we have to get down to the root of what patients are truly saying are, are unaffordable and go from there. Uh, the other thing is that I think we really need to focus in on when we say on the first slide with access, and that's a primary focus, I can tell you from what I'm concerned about, and this is not because our organization gets funding from pharmaceutical companies. I want to make that very clear. This is because I am a person that this happens to all the time. And what happens to me and everyone I know is every year the insurance company decides if my drug is going to be on the formulary. And every year I have to stand there like a Plinko board at the bottom, just juggling, just hoping that my drug doesn't get cut or that I have to go through hoops. And so what I see is what could happen with the UPL and why I'm looking at other creative solutions, which was just said before me, would love to talk about those, is that one of two situations is going to happen. That drug that's on there for my disease, which has alternative therapies, which I don't personally believe there is such a thing because not every not every drug works for every patient just because we have a shared disease diagnosis, but because I have other options out there or they think I do. What will happen is if there's a UPL applied to that one drug that's under review, one of two things. If I'm on the drug and it, or if I'm not on the drug, if I'm on the drug and it works and everything goes through the, 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 excuse me, the pharmacist can still stock it. The infusion center can still afford to stock it because they will be able to be re, uh, reimbursed. The doctor can, can prescribe it. That's all not happening now with biosimilars. We're losing access to those. Let's say it works. Great. That drug works. Everybody is happy. The patient didn't lose access. What about the other 90% of us that have the same diagnosis who just got non-medically switched? That is not being thought of. And that's why patients are fearful. So even if it's not the drug that's under review, but we're in the same therapeutic class, doing this risks the rest of us losing the miracle drug. And I just need everybody to remember that. Thank you. That's great feedback. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And I think a, a couple of the comments that folks have made um, in response to this question is a nice segue into uh, the next question. But before I do that, I just want to make sure uh, anyone else have any uh, feedback specific to, um, you know, uh, you know, other effective approaches in terms of addressing affordability generally. Just don't want to stifle any conversation. Abby, this is Lauren. In interest of time, I'm just okay. throwing some things in the chat. Okay, is great. That okay? No, agree. That's totally okay. And uh, for, for everyone's awareness, you should have received um, an opportunity to participate in two of these sessions. So, you know, I, I want everybody to have as much time as, as, as they want to take to be able to respond or provide feedback. So um, uh, I don't want anyone to feel rushed. So please take your time if you've got, uh, if you do want to uh, say something uh, to the group or, or as uh, Lauren's doing, place something in the chat. Uh, there's this email. You can always provide uh, comments there uh, as well if you think of something after the fact. But I uh, definitely want to hear everything you have to say. Um, you know, one of the um, uh, comments that uh, I think, uh, Tiffany, you had made uh, about uh, patient assistance programs. Um, so I'm curious, the, the, the group's perspectives, uh, what your um, stakeholders, um, how they may feel about patient assistance programs. And I ask because some of our survey respondents uh, across constituent groups, um, and this is also uh, in the literature uh, as well, um, folks have made the case or suggested that uh, drug assistance programs actually um, 
have the potential to increase prices um, just based on the sort of interplay between, you know, patient demand and pricing and, um, you know, the idea that, you know, uh, you know, patient assistance programs could discourage patients from using generic drugs or less costly alternatives. Tiffany, I, I, I think I suspect you've got a, a, a thought on that. I, I'm just curious to hear what uh, what this group thinks about those comments, because, again, they're, you know, we're, we're sort of taking a really holistic view across constituent groups and, and want to get everyone's perspective on these issues. Go ahead, Tiffany. Sure. Um, I'd like to just first say that um, in our diseases that are treated with the uh, biologics, there is no generic alternative. A biosimilar is also not a generic. So um, that that point of discouraging use of generics is not relevant to our community and to the drugs that would be under review in that respect. Um, the other component of copay assistance programs, as long as the payers, as long as the insurance companies are not applying what's called an accumulator or a maximizer or taking them off altogether and forcing patients into alternative um, funding programs, which is a whole other really horrible issue when you have a disease like mine, um, and saying that uh, they actually help us to be able to make the rest of our health care more affordable because the deductible is met earlier. And as a result, we're able to get MRIs and able to see more specialists. It is a godsend to most patients that I know that live with the diseases. The only times that I hear that it's a problem is typically when a patient is unaware of what's actually happening to them. For example, just yesterday I had a patient saying she couldn't afford one of her drugs because the copay didn't cover enough, but what actually happened is it was an accumulator that was um, applied to her insurance program, so they were not accounting it towards the deductible. So I just think that, again, it's great to have those robust conversations. Would love to hear um, of course, all perspectives are welcome and encouraged, and I would just love to be able to continue conversations to hear all perspectives. It's very wonderful. Thank you. And, and that nuance that, that you made there in terms of the biosimilars and the generics, I think is really important, Tiffany, so I appreciate you making Yes. That. Um, Lauren? Patients' assistance programs are only as good as the pharmaceutical company that's running them. There's a big difference. Uh, you can't you can't compare all drugs and all, with all diseases, and you can't compare patient assistance programs across the board. Um, they are very different, uh, and and there you know there's problems on both sides of that. Um, just this week, uh, well, actually last week um, on Thursday, I got a call from um, a specialty pharmacy here in Portland that was trying to help a patient who had switched jobs after four weeks on um, therapy for Hep C. And his new insurance company denied the refill uh, to continue his treatment. And Gilead couldn't help him because he's insured. And so, I mean, hopefully we got it solved. Um, and hopefully this shown, but, but they, they sold him insurance that has no specialty drugs. No specialty drugs allowed at all. To me, that should be illegal. Um, and that's a cost driver right there. That makes that makes healthcare completely unaffordable. If you have insurance that doesn't cover any drugs, any specialty drugs, then you do not have affordable healthcare. Um, so. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts in terms of patient assistance, patient assistance programs? Right. Um, let's see. Uh, so I want to move on and talk about, um, and, and we've been talking about this a bit uh, already, but thinking about the potential impact of a UPL. So in thinking back to um, Linda's slide, and I don't know, Linda, if you can jump back to that, um, you know, thinking back to uh, the WAC changes uh, that occurred in January of this year, um, that, you know, where, where manufacturers, um, decrease certain, certain public wax for several drugs. Um, I'm just curious, and again, I don't think these are one-to-one -one examples, but we felt that this was kind of an analog to maybe use as a jumping off point. But, um, you know, did, did, 
this experience, um, and I know that each of you represents sort of different uh, populations, so this may not be exactly uh, uh, appropriate for everyone, um, but uh, uh, did this particular event, did, did you hear anything from your stakeholders, uh, folks you represent about, you know, whether to what extent there was an impact uh, as a result of, of this? Positive or negative for that matter? So this is Lauren. I had a really hard time answering this question when you guys asked it because WAC prices are not public knowledge. We we have no idea. Patients have no idea what a WAC price is. But did the but did the fact that uh, manufacturers did decrease WAC for a number of drugs? Did you hear anything about? So it is particularly thinking about some insulins. Uh, the um, Advair, what's that, uh, the inhaler, um, those particular items, anything, did you hear anything um, in terms of, you know, that impacting affordability for individual patients? Well, I, for one, have an EpiPen, so yeah, it's, it's, it's impacted me <laughs> to be more affordable. <laughs> but again, I, 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 you know, we don't know those prices, so it's, it's difficult to know. Um, and thinking about, uh, again, thinking about the potential impact of the UPL, um, you know, to the extent that you, I, it's hard to sort of assess as we talk about the complexity of the supply chain, right? How these things all flow through from, from you know, one, uh, uh, you know, one uh, actor in the supply chain all the way through. But um, do you have, uh, do folks have a sense or, or thoughts on, you know, the extent to which a UPL applied could impact uh, out-of-pocket costs for consumers? And, and you may have ideas on, well, you know, it could have a significant impact if it were applied in this way or if it were applied here. Um, just kind of curious your, your thoughts there. Go ahead, John. Well, I, I think this is why we want to make sure that it's in statute um, or at least rule that any savings that an insurer sees from um, setting a UPL, that it they have to prove how they passed it on to consumers. But that's that's fundamental for our uh, support for this concept. So um, without that, I don't see what we're doing here. So in regulating uh, effectively pass through um, of those savings, um, how how might that be, uh, I'm just thinking practically speaking, um, thoughts on how that might be accomplished? Well, and, and Charlie may know more about this because of the rate review process, but I figure that the rate review process is an opportunity to show that right there and then um, that insurance companies have to go through. Um, I know that Osberg's more engaged on that process uh, than I've ever been. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think I'd say two things. Um, first, uh, I mean, at least from our perspective, kind of the, the value of an upper payment limit is that it reduces the kind of the the price at the top of the funnel, which we understand is not ultimately the price that probably most payers pay. And obviously, you know, isn't what patients are paying. But if you lower the the kind of, you know, the starting bid, so to speak, then, you know, we think that that would cascade down the supply chain and, and reduce costs for uh, insurers. And then ultimately, you know, assuming that there is some sort of mechanism, maybe through writ review for insurers to show, you know, we had these drugs that are now under the UPL, which we are now saving X dollars and therefore, you know, our premium increase is less or, or we're, you know, reducing premiums. Like that, that, that's what we see as a value and, and why it's important to kind of get at prices. Are there other mechanisms? You be uh, both of you mentioned the the rate review process. Are there other mechanisms? I'm just thinking to how other um, state uh, uh, 
affordability boards have been established and you know some states have reporting requirements for you know pbms or uh, insurers i'm just curious are there other mechanisms that you can think of that, that you would recommend um beyond just the rate review process uh to be able to demonstrate that those cost savings has have been uh passed through theoretically a report to the legislature or to the board that is separate from the rate review process Well, I think maybe separately, uh, you know, it's not just kind of commercial payers that are going to be saving money. It's also state payers. So um, to the extent that we can actually calculate how much you know money is saved by the state in terms of, you know, when they are purchasing these drugs, I think could be another way to do it. Other thoughts on that before we move on? Um, my next question, and I think we've we've touched on this a bit uh, in our conversation already, but you know, in looking at the drugs that the board is considering and uh, or or has considered thus far, um, um, you know, or just based on your own uh, personal experience and, and understanding of the issues that your uh, stakeholders face, um, you know, in thinking about those drugs, are there drugs that you would recommend that would be more impactful to review than others? Go ahead, Charles. Um, so this is maybe a little bit of a different question, but one of the things that we wanted to recommend was, and I think there's conversations about this happening in other states, is um, in addition to kind of going through the uh, affordability review process, which then leads to UPL, I think we would love to see um, a UPL where um, if Medicare, uh, you know, when they they're starting to negotiate prices for drugs when they kind of set the price that they're paying for the 10 drugs that they're going to negotiate for each, each year. The UPL in Oregon would kind of just uh, somehow like automatically mirror that for um, the state. So we kind of get to have a bigger bang for our buck because, you know, we're not having to go through the that kind of long process of affordability reviews. The federal government has already kind of done that for us. And then we're also able to have a larger impact because, um, you know, it's just kind of supplementing the work that the federal government is already doing by setting the UPL to what the what Medicaid or Medicare has negotiated. Along those lines, would you all, and because I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, would you also suggest then that there are opportunities, um, you know, to look at other states that are setting UPLs or conducting affordability reviews um, that may look different um, from the list that Oregon's considering? Or do you think there's two, two state specific nuances that um wouldn't make that appropriate i feel less confident in recommending that versus uh the feds <laughs> that's fair just thought i'd ask <clears throat> tiffany yeah thank you um i would say as far as consideration of other drugs one of the my kind of specialties i is not advocacy per se, it's research advocacy. So my background is very strong in research. I've been a patient research partner as well for over a decade. And actually Lauren, who's on here, and several of um, other organizations actually came together in part thanks to conversations with Oregon PDAB. And we have created what we believe is a very robust um, data collection survey to collect information from patients and caregivers about affordability issues based on surveys, existing surveys we've seen in other states that are severely lacking in context and actually have led to somewhat biased analysis. So I would suggest really diving deep into the data and understanding not only from contextual, why is a patient saying this? Why are they saying, do they know? Do they know what this is equating to unaffordability? Is this true out-of-pocket cost? Is this because of the premium? It, what is it? So we're there's void of context currently. The second thing is what makes the drug unaffordable and what is unaffordable to you? $25 is very unaffordable to somebody who is 
um, is a mother of three young children who is working three jobs. Like that is a different affordability. So defining sure. that and understanding the context. And then lastly, um, we need to understand the subgroups so that we can really take information and address affordability. Everyone on here has the same goal, affordable drugs and accessible at the same time. And we can all agree on that. And so understanding if somebody's responding to some of this data, even some of the survey data quoted earlier, are they Medicare patients? Are they Medicaid patients? Where do they come from? Because the PD, the PDABs are very limited in addressing Medicare so if that can't even be addressed, at least we can we can take the information and put it back to legislators and say, hey, we have identified these really in, important affordability points. And that's how we and then from there, you could find the drugs that make the most sense. So really sort of getting granular about it, it needs to be. It is so surface level and so broad that we're just assigning affordability to everyone. I mean, we're going totally against everything we've worked for, for health equity and, and, and understanding from a granular. I mean, what I, what I say, just because of my diagnosis is not necessarily what someone else is going to say. And as pointed out by many before me, this is not a one size fits all solution. So maybe we can find several different points and then the board can be super effective. And, and just to make sure I captured it correctly, because I don't want to, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You know, you mentioned, you know, what makes something unaffordable to an individual is going to be different. Individual A is likely going to be a different from individual B. Some of those things could be, you know, structure of their insurance plan, co-pays, things like that. But I thought I also heard you suggest that, you know, things like social determinants of health and kind of health-related social needs, those are all things that, 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 determine affordability. It, it does. And I can give you just a really quick example. Um, in the in in a in the Colorado PDAB in their survey, um, there were several patients that reported that they were not able to afford one of the drugs and that they were compromising house payments and that four of them went into medical debt. But when you looked at the raw data, it specifically said they paid zero to fifty dollars out of pocket. So something's not right there. So that's what I'm talking like there's something else <laughs> that that's not captured. So the right data collection is 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 the key to getting all of that granular information. That's that's great. That's a really nuanced point. I appreciate you making mm -hmm. that. Um, and the the survey data that you'd suggested, is that information that you've provided to the Oregon PDAB? Uh, or, or, you know, if it, we are it's, going to, yeah. so, um, yes, Lauren just put, we will have the survey ready soon. We actually, it is complete. We've just put it through one more round of vigorous reviews from other, um, research professionals and data collection professionals and just getting the T's crossed and the I's dotted. It'll, I believe be published on Tuesday. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know we're getting right at time. We've got, uh, two more folks with hands up. I'm thinking if, if, if people don't mind me, we could do these last two comments. And then uh, again, like I said, we've got a number of questions that we can kind of uh, uh, come back to uh, when we have our next call. So um, if folks don't mind, John, uh, comments? Sure, uh, really quickly. Um, I just wanted to react to the idea of um, looking at what another state's done and just choosing that. And that is that what the needs are in Oregon may be completely different from what the needs are in a place like Maryland. Like maybe, maybe you know, the 10 drugs that the PDAB comes up with here, three of them are the same as what uh, the Maryland PDAB chooses, and you can share data and look at that data together and you can analyze it. But I wouldn't say that you should just say, well, Maryland did this, therefore we're going to do that too. Um, you know, and I do like that consideration of certain uh, populations that we have that might not be in other places as well. You know, we have a uh, pretty large uh, Native American population in this state that may have different needs than um, other folks. Um, and, you know, as much as we do agree that using the Medicare most um, uh, maximum fair price is a good starting point, let's be honest, that only affects certain parts of the population, my part of the population. Um, uh, primarily, but at the same time, there's clearly going to be other needs within the state besides just that. Sure. Thank you for that. 
and last but not least, John, other John? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bobby, to your question about what uh, drugs the PDAB is uh, considering. First of all, uh, OCAP has no position on any individual drugs, as I stated earlier on. Um, in addition, um, Oregon is basically starting all over on its affordability review. And also, uh, as far as PDAB is concerned with uh, looking at UPLs, it's it's a feasibility study. So it's a process issue. So we're nowhere near taking a look at what actual drugs will be under review. Well, um, like I said, we're a little bit over time. I want to uh, thank everyone for their their feedback today. This has been a really uh, helpful discussion. Um, you know, uh, like I said, there's another opportunity to kind of work through some more uh, questions that we have uh, that we'd like your input on. Uh, if you're not able to attend uh, or, you know, you think of something in the middle of the night and you want to make sure you share with us, uh, Linda has uh, attached uh, in the chat um, this email address. Anything that you provide us, uh, we'll make sure it gets uh, sort of taken into our report uh, to the board, uh, our stakeholder report to the board. Um, and then you can also submit a uh, comment, obviously, through the board's website. So, uh, again, thanks, everybody, for attending today. Uh, we look forward to hopefully speaking with all of you again uh, during our next call. Thank you.